Okay, good morning, everybody, and Hazak Baru. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, everybody. And um, today's, uh, today's class is sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shema of all of Am Yisrael. Uh, our parasha, my friends, is called Perashat Shelah, which famously has in it the sin of the spies. Remember, Moshe Rabbeinu, he sends 12 spies to the land of Israel, and they come back with a negative report. doesn't play out well. Only two of them have something nice to say. The other ten spread lies and negativity and gossip. And uh, eventually the people buy this, uh, this lie of the ten spies. And they cry and they kind of despair and give up. To the point that God is so angry that he tells the nation that you will not enter the land of Israel. You guys are going to have to stay here for the next 38 years till you all die out. And your children will enter the land of Israel. And that's what happened. We were stuck. We were punished for 40 years to remain in the desert instead of what would have been just one or two years. And um, it was only later, 40 years later, 38 years later, with Yehoshua, Moshe's student. And uh, Yehoshua is actually one of the two people that actually had a positive report. It was only with Yehoshua who took us into the land of Israel that... Um, he, he was the one that took us in uh, 40 years later. Okay, this is the story of Al Parasha in a nutshell. Again, there's a, lot, there's a lot more detail. But this is simply put, the mission of the spies. Okay, the 12 spies that Moshe sent. What's very interesting is um, if we fast forward to when it was Yehoshua's turn. <laughs> when it's Yehoshua's turn to take the people into the land of Israel. Forward, right, 38 years later. Right? Um, if you open up to the book of Joshua, which is one of the books of the Tanakh, you'll find in there something that's a little bit crazy. Okay, open up, my friends, please, to the book of Yehoshua, chapter 2. <laughs> and take a look right there in the first pasuk, Vayishlach Yehoshua bin Nun. And now when it's Joshua's turn to send in, uh, to go into Israel, what does he do? If there's anything that Yehoshua shouldn't do, right? If, if you go, if you interviewed Yehoshua, he said, listen, Yehoshua, thank you for joining us on the show. Um, anything that you learn from your rabbi, from, your, from the mistakes of your mentor, anything that you shouldn't do, uh, please, Mr. Joshua. I think Yoshua, if there's anything that he learned, right, don't send spies, okay? And all of a sudden, chapter 2, we read very clearly, All of a sudden, when it's Yoshua's turn, he makes the same mistake as his mentor, as his rabbi, as Moshe Rabbeinu, and he sends Two spies to the land of Israel, Heresh Lemor, saying to them, Lechu re'u et ha'aretz v'etiri ho, go see the land, go see Jericho, v'yolchu. And the story continues, it's a very interesting story actually, how these two spies um, that Yehoshua sends, they go, they wind up in a lady's house, her name is Rahav, and uh, she says, we heard all about what the people, uh, what you did to the nations, and we're very afraid of you here. And then uh, the, the people of, of, of Canaan, they hear that Rahav is hiding two people in her house. So they send uh, soldiers and she hides them and they escape and they come back. And actually, it ends up being a very successful mission. Very successful mission. They come back to Yoshua, right? Yoshua, we got good news. God is giving us the land of Israel. And everyone there is afraid. And then he wakes up the next morning and they wage war. And they go into, into Israel. Right? Very beautiful. That's how it should have been 40 years ago with Moshe. So the question, my friends, today that I would like to discuss is what was the difference between Moshe's spies and Yehoshua's spies? Why is it that round one, Moshe sends spies, it does not go well? And then many years later, when Yehoshua sends spies, it succeeds. And this question is tackled and addressed by the Malbim. In the book of Joshua. And over here, <clears throat> Malbim says all of, all of the answers lie in the first pasuk. The first pasuk, I'll read it again. Yehoshua bin Nun min hashitim, shnaim anashim meraglim. Yehoshua bin Nun sends from Shitim two men, spies. Lemor to see lechure uet aret, go see Israel, ve'et Yericho and Jericho. They come to the house of a lady by the name of Rachav. Says the Malbi, let's read it together, my friends. 
The Pasuk here is coming to answer the question that automatically would enter your mind when you're reading this verse. What in the world is, is Yehoshua thinking? How could he send uh, spies? By the way, let's not forget, Yehoshua was one of the 12. Yes, he was one of the guys that went. So he saw firsthand how dangerous the spies could be, that uh, what, it gets to you. You didn't learn your lesson. You were part of the 12, Yehoshua. You were the last of the Mahigans, right? Right? So what, what, what are you doing sending spies now, 38 years later? Meshiv, the Pasuk is answering, my friends. There are five differences between Joshua's spies and Moshe's spies. And let us tackle them one by one. Number one, the spies that Moses sends, was actually, whose idea was it to send spies with Moshe? Hayu al pi It was actually the people that requested it. Like it says in Devarim, Moshe says, you guys approached me and you guys asked for spies. Yeah? Because it was the people that sent the spies, so now it's the people that the spies need to report to. And the people believe the spies, and that's how it all went south. Over here, Yehoshua sends them, not the people. And he'll explain in a minute why that matters. But that's first of all difference number one. Number one, who's doing the sending? By Moshe, it was the people. Over here, it's the leader. Number two, Moshe shalham emidbar paran. Moses sends the spies from Paran, Paran Desert. Hayarahok, very far. Hayu mistapikim be mahuta aret vayechotad chopsha. So what does that tell you? If you're sending spies from very far, it's telling you that the question is, should we go? Yes, before we waste time and get closer, should we even go? Aval Yehoshua shalah min hashitim. Yehoshua is sending spies right across the border. It's the border of Israel. The question was not, should we go? Rather, from where should we go? Yes, and it's such an important lesson in life. It's all about the questions that we ask. The questions that we ask. Yes, it's not, right, over here, the, with Moshe, it was, should we conquer it? When that's the question that you're asking, then already there's, a, there's an opening for no. When Yehoshua sends the spies, 38 years later, the question was not the same question. It was not, should we go? We're going. It already creates within with the person's mindset uh, a different approach. When a person says, I'm going, the only question is where, how? Yeah? That's the question. And in life, so much of being successful is about knowing what question to ask. Yes? If a person's doubting, should I, shouldn't I? So already you're playing around there's, in, there's, there's insecurity, there's a, there's a potential that you're, you're opening the door for a no. The person's confident. This is something that I'm going to do. The only question is, how do I do it? Right? I heard something very wise one time. When you're, when you're young, yeah, you ask, how will I do this? When you get older, you don't ask how, but you ask who. Yes, you ask who is the right person that I could get to do this. Meaning when you're young, you think it's all about me. I got to do it. How will I do it? And as you get older, we start changing the questions that we ask ourselves. And we start realizing that I need a team. And if I'm a, if I'm a successful CEO, I have to hire a network of people around me. So the question is not how, but who? Who's the right person for the job? The quality of our lives depends on the quality of the questions that we ask. Over here, when Moshe sends the spies, they were very far. The question was not, not uh, at least in the spies' head, it was should we do this? And they went with that attitude, with that approach of should we, should we? That's a very dangerous question. When you know that the right thing is yes, as opposed to maybe asking how, right? How do I do this? Whether it's in dating or in uh, relationships, or a person needs to know that uh, this is something I'm going to do, right? If a person knows I'm going to, I need to stay married. The question is how, how could I stay married to this person, right? If you go to the therapist and you're asking, should I stay married? That's a very different question than how, how do I make this work? 
Yes, it's a very different question. Number three. Number three. Moshe shalach shnem asar tarim. Moshe sends 12. How many men? 12. How many men does Yehoshua send? Yehoshua shalach shnaim. Yehoshua sends two. It's very interesting because it ends up being that in both stories, the only common thread is that two people have something nice to say. In the Moshe's time, two people have something nice to say. And in Yehoshua, also only two people. But those were the only two that he sent, yes? So he explains like this. There's a difference between a tar and a meragel. In Hebrew, the word by Moshe, the verb used is latur. To, 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 to look. Latur is to spy. But it's different than meragel, which is used here. Hatar someone who's in Hebrew tar means to look is it good or bad are they weak or strong etc Meragel that's not his purpose he a Meragel is looking at the weakness of the land explains the Malbim as follows pay attention there are two types of Messengers. Number one, and he's going back to re explain what he said, the first three differences. When the people send, when the people are sending the spies with Moshe's time, what is the goal of the people sending? They want to know if it's good or bad, right? Is it worth uh, fighting over this country? Maybe we should uh, go to Croatia. Beautiful, I heard over there. Maybe we should go to Switzerland. Very nice. Maybe we should go to the fjords. I don't know. Who said Israel is a country worth fighting over? So when that's the question, which is how it was unfortunately the first time with Moshe, the people wanted to know, where, where are we going? Israel, I, I never heard of it. I don't, I don't see it on, uh, on the magazine's top 12 places in the world. It's not on a bucket list, Israel. Yeah? Uh, is it like Banff? Is it like, uh, is it like national parks? Is it like uh, right the wonders of the world? I don't know. I didn't see it. Let's see. Let's send spies. So when that's the question, you'll need to send one per tribe. Nasi mikol shevet. One for every tribe. Why? Look at this. Ki lo yismechu baze al anashim pchotim. Ve lo yismechu shevet al shaliach shal shevet aher. Because I can't trust a messenger from a different tribe. Because your tribe, your livelihood is from uh, sailing. You do commerce overseas. So you're going to be looking at it from that aspect. We were in the sand business. Or somebody else is in, the, is in the trade business. Somebody else is in mountains. Somebody else needs this. Everyone needs a different type of uh, geography. And therefore, therefore, I need to send my own tribe who knows what our tribe is looking for. That, the interests of our own people. Based on my tribe, based on my occupation, vocation. If you're a farmer, if you're a shepherd, is it good for sheep? Is it good for sailing? Is it good for business? Is it good for commerce? Yeah? And that's why when it comes to Moshe's time, they send the 12 spies, 12 of them. Because the question is, should we conquer this land? Is it a good place to live? And therefore, you need one representative from each tribe. And that's how, that's how it ended up getting very, very problematic and messy. But when the, when the person that you sent, like Yehoshua does, is a meragel, we're already conquering it. The question is just from where? What's the easiest place to enter? So you don't need 12 people. You don't need a representative of every tribe. This is not a, uh, this is not a question of aesthetics. This is not a question of uh, lifestyle. This is a question of army. Of, of, this is a, a question for the general, for the, for the soldiers, for the, for the lieutenant, for the chief of staff. So over here, the general is sending the people. So he only needs two spies. This is a, uh, this is a decision uh, as far as battle is concerned. This is not for lifestyle, for livelihood. So over here, two is, two is enough. That's why Yoshua only sends two. And not 12. Unbelievable. And that's why he only sent regular people. Lo Nesim, he didn't send princes. You didn't, need, you didn't need a prince. Moshe needed to send the princes because the question of the people was, is this a place that we're going to appreciate, to enjoy? So they had to send people that knew what they were talking about. 
But Yehoshua, the question again, was more from military standpoint. Number four, Shalham Heresh. Pasuk over here writes in Yehoshua, Vaishlach Yehoshua binun from Shittim, Shnaim Anashim Meraglim Heresh. He sends two people, Heresh. What's Heresh? Anyone know? Heresh is quietly. Quietly. Bishtika. Ish lo yada badavar. Nobody knew about this. Rak hu levado. This, my friends, is very powerful. That in life, to be successful, we have to be modest. For something to go well, for a mission to be successful, you gotta be tsanua. Right? Very hard for us to hear this message in today's day and age where everything is flashy, everything is public, everything that we do needs, people, everyone needs to know about it. We got to publicize it. We got to post it on social media. It's the age of advertising ourselves for everyone to see. Everyone needs to know what I'm doing. But the truth is, to be successful, we have to be tzanua. We have to be secretive. We have to be hidden. The Pasuk says, Yishlach Hashem et lecha et ha-beracha ba'asamecha. Yitzav, excuse me, Yitzav Adonai Delchat et ha-beracha ba'asamecha. God's going to command and give blessing ba'asamecha. That word ba'asamecha means, the Gemara explains, that bracha comes on something that's hidden from the eye. If you want bracha, don't count. Don't count your money. Don't count your success. Keep it hidden. When something's counted, it's already counted. It's already a number. It's very hard now, once it's a number, to, for, the, for Hashem to come in and do bracha. Yeah? So long that something is, is, is hidden, so now God could still add bracha. The Gemara says that before you count your grains, you could pray, God, please let there be bracha. But once you already have counted, you already know how much there is. So how are you going to pray for bracha anymore? You can't pray. It's already finite. You already know there's a hundred pieces here. So what are you praying? That God should change it from a hundred to hundred five? That's cool. That's called an open miracle. God doesn't do open miracles. So if you didn't count, so no one knows, so God can make it 105. That's a hidden miracle. That's easier to do. Easier meaning not, not easy for God. For God, everything's the same. But it's easier vis-a-vis -vis us. Because once it's known, God has to do an open miracle. God doesn't like to do open miracles. He doesn't like to change nature. So a person prays when something is not known. When it's not yet, when there's no finite amount. That's why it's very important to keep things in life Secret, low, hush, hush. The more you publicize, the more people know, the harder it is for bracha to enter. That's why the first tablets we know didn't last. The first tablets were broken. Because the first tablets, what happened? The first luchot were given with lightning and thunder and the light show. The first tablets were given... Wow, a lot of publicity. Ended up not making it. It was only the second Luchot that were given very quietly. If you look in the Torah, you don't see anything really about the second tablets. The second tablets, you know, God is teaching us a lesson that if you want something in life to last, keep it low key. Yeah? If you want your marriage to last, don't, you don't have to tell everyone about everything about you. If you want your business to be successful, be humble, be modest. Ba'asamecha. Yeah? You got to be, sometimes we got to be tzanua. Yehoshua knows this lesson. He learned this lesson. The first time, everyone knew about the, 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 the spies. And once everyone's talking, it can't, it can't play out well. Yehoshua, cheresh, quietly. And finally, the last difference is lechure ueta'aretz. Go see the land, and specifically, he tells them what specifically to see. Yericho. Yericho. And the truth is, if you look at their mission, how many days were they there for? The first spies were there for 40 days. They were punished. Yom Lashana. Every day they got punished a year. 40 days, 40 years. The second spies. And it was less people, mind you. So if you, you think about it, less people would need more time. You would think, right? It's a sixth. So they would need six times the, the length. They would need 240 days. Do you know how many days the spies stayed in Israel with Yehoshua? The second time around when they went to, they stayed there for three days. Imagine, two people, three days. Twelve people, they took their time, 40 days, right? Because Yehoshua gave them a specific mission. 
This is what I'm sending you to do. This is what I'm sending you to accomplish. So this is what the Malbim writes. Beautiful idea. I'd like to share with you one more idea, one more lesson from Rabbi uh, Jacobson. He says if you hear on this, on this uh, perasha, he brings the Midrash. Take a look, my friends, um, uh, to the Midrash. The Midrash says like this. Rabbi Nehemiah Omer, Kle kederot haya beyadam. Kederin heresh. What does it mean, heresh? It says Yahushua sends the twelve, the two men, heresh lemor. Heresh, Rabbi Nehemiah explains, means pottery. Heres, kli heres, pottery, earthenware. Earthenware vessels. So according to Rabbi Nehemiah, he sent them with earthenware vessels. Go as if you're selling pottery. Yeah? As if you're selling some, uh, some china. Okay? That's Rabbi Nehemiah. Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai though, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, no, heresh doesn't mean pottery, earthenware. Heresh means like we said, deaf. And what does that mean? He sent them deaf. What do you mean go deaf? Asu atzmechem harashim ve'atem omdim al razehem. Go as if you're deaf and you'll be able to eavesdrop and overhear everybody's conversation. Okay? Now, it's a very nice idea. But, I mean, if you really stop and think for a second, does it really work? Yeah, imagine, imagine you, you, want, you have something secretive to say. Right? And you pull your friend over, you say, come, I want to tell you something secret. And all of a sudden, the, uh, a person is standing right next to you. And you say, sir, could you please move? I'd like some privacy. And the guy looks at you and says, he starts doing sign language. Trying to indicate that he's deaf. If you really had something secretive to say, would you just trust this guy as like that's telling you on face value, I'm deaf? You, oh yeah, he look, he's doing the signs, must be he's deaf. Right? So what kind of tactic is this? Walk in as if you're deaf? <laughs> Did it really fool anybody? They walk around deaf and they were able to hear all the secret conversations? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's a great joke. About uh, you know in the times of the of the czar they had the um, the draft where they drafted youth into the army. So what would people do? They would uh, they would make believe they were injured, they were crippled. They would try to get out of the draft, not to have to serve in the army of the czar. So one day a kid walks in and he makes believe he's deaf. So the guy asks him every question possible: What are you doing? How are you? Where are you from? And everything the guy says. Can't hear you, I can't hear you. He's trying to get out of it. So finally, this uh, general, he says, okay, you're free to go home. And the kid says, yes, he gets up and leaves. And of course, <laughs> the general pulls him back down and drafts him into the army, right? So you, you, you can't always, right? You, someone says that they're fake, that they're, that they're deaf. You could sometimes see if they're faking it, if it's legit. So what exactly, what exactly is this lesson of here from Yahushua? And Rabbi Jacobson says if you hear something very powerful that I would like to elaborate on for a few moments, and that is that in life, if we want to be successful in our mission, and we all have a mission, every one of us is here with a mission. We're here with a mission in life. God sent you here. Something specific that you need to do that you can do. And to be successful in your mission, Yehoshua is telling these two spies, but really he's telling every single one of us for the rest of time, that to be successful in whatever you want to do in life, you need to act deaf. You need to make believe that you can't hear. You got to be able to take your fingers and put it in your ears and ignore the world. Because let me tell you something, my friends. The world is going to do everything that it can to pull you down, to tell you that you're not good enough, to tell you that whatever it is that you're trying to achieve is unachievable, to tell you that you'll never do it, that you'll never be successful. People tried. You're crazy. To be successful, Hirish, you got to silence these voices. We got to be able to silence these naysayers. We got to tell all these crazy people, the people that tell us that we're crazy, to be able to laugh at them and to say, doesn't matter. I know that what I'm doing is right. I know what I'm doing is right. To be Hirish, to be deaf to the face of criticism, to the face of negativity. Now, that does not mean, that does not mean, my friends, that we shouldn't open up ourselves 
to sometimes people who have critique for us, people that have advice for us, 100%, very important in life to be able to hear. Sometimes, maybe what we're doing is the wrong thing. We definitely need to have people in our lives that can guide us, that can counsel us, that can guide us, that can tell us if what we're doing is the right thing or the wrong thing. Everybody needs parents or um, mentors, rabbis, rabbitans, someone that I can ask in my life, is this, is this something that I should keep pursuing? David HaMelech himself, he says, David says, when, when my enemies would stand up and criticize me, I open my ears. Sometimes you have to hear criticism. Sometimes we have to be able to someone to tell us that what we're doing, what we're pursuing is wrong. Sometimes we have to hear how someone is trying to guide us, if it's someone that cares about us, to be able to be honest and to hear. Because in life, it's very important to get outside advice. So that's on the one hand, it's true. But, but... We cannot listen to every single opinion out there, my friends. And the person has to know when to shut their ears to the outside world. And sometimes there'll be people that look at you and say, what are you, what are you doing? Are you crazy? This lifestyle, being a Jew, it's outdated, it's, it's incorrect. What are you supporting? What do you follow? What do you observe? You're nuts, you're religious, you're this, you're that. And sometimes we have to be able to know that if we're going to open up and listen to every opinion that's out there, will never become anything in life. Yoshua says to the spies, to the two men that he sends, I'm sending you, make sure you go heresh. You got to go deaf. In life, of course we need mentors. But we need to also learn resilience. Right? What do they say? They say that in your life, in life you're nuts until you make it. And then you're all of a sudden a genius. Right? Every successful person out there was once upon a time told that their idea is ridiculous, that their idea will never make it, it'll never surface. And if you don't have thick skin, if we're not resilient, if we don't have the ability to make ourselves like we're deaf, then you'll listen to everybody and every voice and then you'll never lift off, you'll never take off, you'll never do anything. So number one in life, my friends, we have to know Khirish, we have to be, we have to be sometimes deaf. To the face of naysayers. Stories told of Sarah Schneer that when she was sitting with the first Beis Yaakov, the first girl school, and there were many naysayers, trust me, my friends, for her, there were many uh, opposers to uh, her institution of Jewish schools for girls. And um, she was sitting, the story is told when she was sitting in the first class with her students, there were people outside that opposed what she was doing, although she got many endorsements from big rabbis. Again, she asked questions, she got advice, she seeked outside counsel. She didn't just go into it blind. She, she went to great rabbis. And once they told her that what you're doing is appropriate and worth it, so then she, she shut her ears and she went full steam ahead. And she didn't care what anyone had to say about it. And the story is that uh, when she was sitting in the class with a few girls, the first class, the first class of girls that she taught, Someone from the outside, an enemy, of course, threw a rock into the building that landed right there in the circle. And she smiled, she picked up the rock, and she said, well, girls, this rock will be the foundation of the second building that we're going to build. You understand, my friends, this is the ability in life to be heresh. I remember hearing a very nice mashal parable from my brother, Rabbi Yaakov, about a, um, a musician who was once stranded on an island and this musician was a very good musician at that, at that. He knew how to play the violin beautifully. He could put you to sleep with his music. Kind of like my uh, classes, I put people to sleep sometimes. Someone told me that. I don't know if that was a compliment or an insult, but uh, either way. Okay, so this guy, you know the joke, right? <laughs> this rabbi is, uh, is speaking and one by one, everybody leaves until there's only one guy left. One guy left. So um, after the rabbi is done speaking, he gets down and he goes over to this guy and he says, you know, I really appreciate you. You stayed all the way till the end. It's very nice of you. Everyone left and you stayed. And the guy looks at him and he says, of course I stayed. I'm the next speaker. <laughs> right? So anyways, the story is of this musician that was very good 
at putting people to, sp to sleep with his music. He was so talented. And he's stranded on this island, and all of a sudden, middle of the night, he hears a, uh, some noise coming from the trees next to him, and all of a sudden, he looks up and he sees this huge bear, and um, the bear starts approaching, growling, and this musician, afraid for his life, how's he going to outrun a bear? He can't outrun a bear. He realizes, you know what? Let me use my, my talent, my strength. So what does he do? He pulls out his violin, and he starts playing music, hoping it'll put the bear to sleep. And lo and behold, it works. <laughs> the bear goes to sleep and the man was uh, able to, to leave, to escape, uh, to safety. A few minutes later, again, the guy hears some noise. He looks up and this time he sees uh, a cheetah. And the guy's getting very nervous. But, but he remembers if he took care of the bear, then how hard could the cheetah be? He pulls out the, the violin. He starts playing music. Sure enough, the cheetah fell to sleep, fell asleep. And all of a sudden, third time, comes out a lion. All of a sudden, already by this point, the musician is fearless, he's relaxed, he's calm, just a piece of cake. He grabs out his violin, he starts playing. But unfortunately, as he's playing, the lion keeps approaching. The music's not working. He plays louder, he plays faster, and the lion, of course, doesn't stop. And it finally jumps. And it kills this musician. And this is a parable, my friends. And the question is, what changed with the lion? Why didn't the guy's music work on the lion? And the answer that he gave, beautiful, I think it's really touching on what we said today. And that is that the lion wasn't able to be silenced by the music because the lion was deaf. So the lion couldn't hear the musician playing. You see, in this world, there are going to be people that are going to try to play music that are going to try to knock you down, they are going to try to tell you you can't be, tell you that you're not good, tell you that you'll never be. Look at that person. They're so much better than you. They're much more talented. They're prettier. They're richer. They're smarter. They're better. They're better. And um, if you're going to open up yourself and listen to every one of those voices, the only, the only result will be we're going to be silenced by the music. We're going to be put to sleep. If you want to be a lion, if you want to be successful, if we want to be, if we want to conquer and achieve in life, like the line, we got to be deaf. We have to be able to know when to not allow the, the negativity of the world around us to get to us. Again, it's a balance. It's a balance. You got to know when to hear what people are trying to advise us and guide us in. 100%. We got to seek advice of the outside world. But on the other hand, at this very same time, my friends, at the very same time, we also have to know that um, at a certain point, when I know what I'm doing is right, when I know what I'm doing is right, it doesn't matter what other people say. You know, this reminds me of something that I'm learning with my Tuesday night class. Um, there's a gentleman's class that I give in the synagogue. We're doing Mesilat Yesharim. And Mesilat Yesharim is a very important work, very important book. I, I urge everybody to study this. If you can, slowly, thoroughly, We've been at this for already two years and we're only up to chapter number five. And we're studying this consistently every single week. And it's, I think it's a game changer. It's a life changer. Really uh, helping a person how to uh, grow step by step in uh, character and in uh, holy work of God. And right here in the fifth chapter, my friends, from Chal, Rav Moshe Chaim Lotzato, the author of this book, he discusses... <clears throat> He discusses what are the reasons that sometimes in life we fail to grow. What is it that what is the reason that sometimes in life we fail to achieve, to succeed? What are the reasons that sometimes we fail to introspect and to become better people? And he narrows it down to three reasons. And just to touch on the first two very quickly, because it's not the point of what I'm trying to bring out, but the first one is, he says, number one, is because we are um, we don't have time. We don't have time to stop and think and introspect. Why is it that sometimes we're not, we're not the best fathers and mothers to our children? Because we don't have time to stop and think about our parenting. Why are we not the best spouses? Because we don't have time to stop and think about our marriage. We don't have time. I'm too busy. I got to run to work. I got to run to feed. I got to run to do. I got to run. I got to run. I got to run. We're, whole, we're running our entire lives from, uh, from uh, job to home to work to job to, to right? hobby. 
and we're caught up in this rat race. And sometimes a person has to just stop and think and reflect. What am I doing? Where am I going? Am I, am I happy? Am I doing the right things in my life? So this is le- lesson number one, that a person cannot allow um, tipul, tirda, preoccupation, busyness can be very, very dangerous. When I'm so, so, so busy, I don't have time to stop and reflect. Number two, he says, is letzanut. Letzanut means, letzanut means um, uh, a scoffer is literally the translation. And it's that it, even if sometimes in life we do think about what we should be doing, uh, but letzanut means that we just dismiss it. We laugh at it, right? We, we laugh at it, we mock, right? He elaborates on this idea. Number three, my friends, is, this is for us, huwa khivra. Number three are our friends. What that means is that in life, sometimes, sometimes we're ready to grow. We're ready to achieve. We're ready to start doing something better. But you know why we don't? Because of our friends. Because what will people say? I can't, because if I start doing that, people are going to start thinking that I became all religious. I can't, because if I, if I marry that person, they don't have... Maybe the status that people expect me to marry. And although I love them and they're an amazing person, but what will people say? And sometimes we live our lives because what will people say? And we need to remember, my friends, that sometimes we have to turn deaf to the world. Don't worry about what people say. What will you say? What do you want to do? If you don't want to live your own life, if you're not going to live the life that you want to live, then who's going to live it for you? You know, they ask people in a hospice, what's your biggest regret? And one of the biggest regrets is that I, was, I wasn't able to live the life that I wanted to live. I lived how other people expected me to live. I married someone that I was expected to marry. I lived in a community that they told me I should live in. And I were, prayed in a synagogue and I went and I, and I really, I didn't want to always do those things. But I did it because of peer pressure. I did it because of that's what my friends, that's what the people around me. To be successful in life, Yehoshua is teaching us. He tells the spies, Heresh, you got to be deaf. You got to forget about the people around you. You got to forget about what the world's going to say. And you have to know that if this is what you believe in deep down, and you thought about it, and it makes sense, and in your gut you realize that this is the right thing to do, the right approach, then you got to do it. You got to go, and you got to fight for it. And you got to have resilience and forget about the world. Because ultimately, there will always be haters. There will always be haters and you can never make everybody happy. Right? The famous joke that we say all the time. So I apologize if I said it before. The joke is about a man who was walking with his son. And this man was on, the, was on the donkey. And his son was walking. And as they pass by a group of old men, the guy overhears the old men saying to each other, Look at this old guy. His strong father. He's on the donkey. He's making his young weak son walk what kind of father is this what happened to the days where men used to be men the father should let his son be on the donkey so as they turn the corner the father realizes you know what the people are talking about us he says son let's switch so he puts the son on the donkey and he's walking and they pass by a group of another old men another group of old men and he overhears these old men saying to each other unbelievable where's the respect these days ah huh? this little kid is making his old man walk in my day, we stood up for the elderly. Now, look at this world. So as they turn the corner, the father realized, you know what? It also, they're right. So he tells his son, come, I'm going to get on the donkey. He gets on the donkey with his son, and they're riding together. All of a sudden, they pass by a group of uh, a third group of old men. And he hears the old guy saying to each other, look at this, two people on a donkey. Where's the pity? Where's the mercy? At least one at a time. He's both on the donkey. Have some, have some rahmanut. So the father, they turn the corner, he says, all right, son, we both got to get off. And they both get off, and as they're walking next to the donkey, both of them, they pass by a group of old men, and the father overhears one of the old guys saying to the other old guy, hey, Joe, look, three hamorim. <laughs> look, three idiots, right? The donkey and the two others. They're not walking, they're not uh, using him, right? You see in life, this joke, I think it's a beautiful joke, a very, very important lesson. And that is that if we're going to always live our lives based on what other people are going to say, dictated and dancing 
to the tune of everybody around us. We'll never satisfy everyone. We'll never satisfy everyone. We have to realize, says Mesilat Yesharim, that um, <clears throat> that sometimes we 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 don't do the things that we know we should be doing in life because of people around us. Right? That's the chevra. Many many times a person knows the right thing to do, but I can't. I can't. I can't. This is part of the social setting that I'm in. This is part of uh, the friend group that I'm that I'm in. This is part of the community that I'm in. This is what everyone does. And he says over here, and I want to share with you what he says at the end of this chapter. If you find yourself, let's say you find yourself in a situation that people are laughing at you. What should you do? Let's say you, let's say you know. Let's say you know. You know, it's, um, we're in Pride Month. Unfortunately, today, people have pride in the wrong things. But what about being proud as Jews? Says Ramchal, if you see people laughing at you, lo yashit libo el alagahu. Pay no attention to those uh, laughs, to those mocks, to those ridicules. Adraba, contrary. Yilag, you laugh at them. You should think in your head the following. Even if a person had opportunity to make a lot of money, if you knew that there was a dumpster that had in their dumpster, there was someone who dropped a six carat ring worth millions of dollars. But the, you got to go through the dumpster to find it. What would you do? Would you jump in? I'm talking about if you needed the money, right? Would you jump in? Of course you would. Ah, but everyone's going to laugh at you and make fun of you. Ah, look at this guy, the dumpster, uh, he smells. <laughs> would you care if people are laughing at you? Of course not. Deep down, you know, you have, you have gold waiting for you on the other side. Kol Shekin, how much more so when a person, not for money, but for values, for decisions of life, why can't we pursue what we know deep down to be true? Sometimes in life we're embarrassed, not of failure, but of success. Sometimes we're embarrassed of our achievements. Sometimes we've achieved great things. I'll give you an example, a person that keeps Shabbat. Could there be anything more beautiful than a person who keeps Shabbat? But sometimes we're embarrassed about that. Sometimes we see people that they ask us, hey, we're going out for Friday, let's go out for dinner. And we know we can't go out, it's Shabbat. Are we proud of the fact that we keep Shabbat? Right? Sometimes we're not so proud. Sometimes we tell them, uh, oh, I can't come, I have a family uh, occasion. Why, why? Why can't we be proud of the fact that I keep Shabbat? I keep kosher, I'm very proud of it. If I go to a restaurant, I'm not eating, I keep kosher. Oh, I'm vegetarian, I have allergies. No, I keep kosher. To be proud of the success, of the achievements that we've attained in our lives. Says Ramchal, to be successful, we have to sometimes be like a lion. You got to be deaf to the music. Our rabbis tell us, Heve az kanamir. You got to be strong like a leopard. You got to be bold, excuse me, like a leopard. What does it mean, bold like a leopard? You got to be bold like a leopard. Sometimes a leopard doesn't care about what other people say. I don't care about what people say. I'm doing what I'm doing. I could care less. You could talk about me. You could laugh at me. You could make fun of me. You could, uh, you, could, you could text about me. I don't care. What do they say? They say that till 20, for the first 20 years of your life, every decision you make, you, you're worried about what people will say. You're thinking about what ramifications it has on other people. For the next 20 years of your life, you don't care what people will say. You do it anyways. And then finally, in the last 20 years of your life, you realize that nobody was saying anything about you to begin with. Nobody was talking about you in the first place. Right? I think, I think it really encapsulates very much this idea of cheresh. It doesn't matter if people are talking about me. It doesn't matter what people say. I know this to be true. This is something that I know deep down is the right thing. And I'm going to live by that. To be az kanemir. To be, to be bold. To be bold like a leopard. David Amela says, David Amela says, I was able to speak. To speak. David with, when David was with other kings, what do kings speak about, my friends? Kings speak about nonsense. They speak about how much money they have. David Amela says, you know what I spoke about? 
I spoke about what interested me. I spoke about Torah. I spoke about mitzvot. I spoke about values. I spoke about ideas. I wasn't embarrassed. Davina Melech, he may have been short, but he was very proud. He had a spine. He was like a leopard. He was bold. It doesn't matter what people are going to say about me. It doesn't matter what people will comment and remark. I know. I know that what I'm saying is valuable. And this is what I'm going to talk about. This was Davina Melech. This is the lesson, my friends, of Heresh. To be, to be deaf in the face of cynicism, in the face of mockery. If we're going to pay attention to every comment that anyone ever says, we're going to be insecure. We're never going to do anything. You can't let it get to you, my friends. You can't let it get to you. We got to know that people will always talk. It doesn't matter. At the end, look, all these successful uh, companies, if they paid attention to every single comment, they wouldn't be who they are today. They wouldn't even uh, take off. They wouldn't start up, nothing. We have to be able in life to know that I'm doing the right thing. And I believe in my product. I believe in who I am. I believe in what I'm doing. I believe in my approach. And if that's the right approach and I believe in it, then again, I've, I've gotten counsel and I've gotten smart people from the outside to be able to tell me and to back what I'm doing is the right thing. Once I have that, we turn deaf, heresh, and then... Unlike the spies in Moshe's time, we will be like the spies of Yehoshua's time. We will be successful in our missions of life. Okay, my friends, we'll stop over here. Have a wonderful day. Hopefully, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.